the cross-examination of the third state witness and Kumalo's neighbor. That's uh, and Tabiseng Mukiti continues in the Santa Mewa murder trial. Yesterday, Mukiti told the High Court in Pretoria how she saw three men fleeing on foot shortly after hearing gunshots the night the soccer star died in 2014. She's the second neighbor to take the stand after the trial restarted last week. Mukiti lived with her sister opposite the Kumalo's Fosloras home. That's where Muiwa was killed. Our reporter Linda Mnisi is watching these developments for us and joins us now in studio for more. Perhaps worth taking a step back, Linda. Mm -hmm. It's the second neighbor we're hearing from. Are the stories corroborating? Well, it's interesting because Tabsin Mukiti is giving us her version from a different, totally different vantage point. You'll remember Kayang Nate told us about how he peeped through the window and he then came out and met this guy who had jumped into the yard. What Ntabi Singh is telling us is that uh, she was sitting in a car with her friend just outside her home um, when suddenly there was a loud sound, like a loud bang. She describes it obviously as a gunshot. Mm. And then shortly after that gunshot, one gentleman walked past. Another shot went off and two guys then went, uh, ran towards the direction of, of the park. Then there was the third shot. What seems to corroborate Zandi Kumalo's uh, testimony here is the issue around the three gunshots. But now, he, he says there was nobody that passed after, um, you know, the gunshots. So, as uh, she was asked about the duration of, you know, these, these, these gunshots, after how long did you hear the gunshots? She says ab ab about 10 to 15 minutes after the first gunshot. So he, she's basically describing a situation where they heard a gunshot, they sat in the car for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then they heard another gunshot, and then shortly after that, another one. She went on during her evidence in chief to describe Ayanda what she saw. Obviously, these were three gentlemen who, were, who had their backs against her, mm -hmm. uh, you know, running towards the park. And she said, well, there were, there were one gentleman had dreadlocks, you know, uh, he was leaner uh, in terms of his physique, and the other one even wore a hoodie. Now, they put to her her statements that she made to the police where she said, I couldn't identify these people. All I saw was that these were just black men. Hmm. So in her evidence in chief, she goes in and gives details around what these guys looked like. And that's where, you know, the, the defense seemed to have been pushing to say, did you even see these people's faces? Did you see where they came from? And she says, no. I did not see where they came from. It was put to her that it could be that these three gentlemen did not even know each other, but of course there was an objection from, from the state and the judge obviously allowing uh, that objection to say, you know, you, you, you can't put that, and he agreed that yeah. it is a matter of argument. Sure. I mean, and it's important, the point that's being made here, right, because the detail is where it ultimately matters, because questions were also raised in court about how much realistically you can remember, given how much time has left and how traumatic the incident might have been. Absolutely. And of course, the conditions under yeah. which all of this happened, we know uh, from Zandi Kumalo, and, you know, all the witnesses that the incident happened around 8 o'clock. So if you're giving evidence and you're saying, uh, this is what I saw, number one, it was at night, where were you? And she says, well, I was sitting in a car. It's interesting that she says, I was sitting um, in the passenger seat behind the driver, um, you know, when these three gentlemen walked past. Were the street lights on? Was there a nearby street light? Mm. And she says, well... There, was, there is no nearby street light. There's just one light that seems to illuminate the, the entire area. So how visible was it? How good was your vision at the time? So all of those details matter. And the question also around the evidence that you're giving in your evidence in chief. Why is it that you did not give it to the police at the time when you were making the statements? You made two statements. She concedes that she made two statements. Um, you know, with the police, first uh, just shortly after the incident took place and um, later after a few years. So both statements don't con contain, essentially, from the defense's point of view, uh, the amount of detail that yeah. she gives during her, her evidence in chief. Sure, which tells us it's either she was telling falsehoods then or now. Either one is important. Linda Misi, thanks very much indeed as we continue watching the ebbs and flows of that story live to us, or whether the story itself is unfolding in the High Court in Pretoria.